Hello, and thank you for joining us for worship with Christ Church United Methodist here in Tucson, Arizona. I am your pastor, Beth Rambicure, and I am so glad you've joined us for worship on this second Sunday of Epiphany. Today, we will be hearing from Pastor Don Finch and give him a big thank you for doing our preaching today. As always, if you're looking for a way to go deeper with Christchurch United Methodist, please check out our website at ccumtucson.org. And now, let us worship together.
dying, for our light has come. The glory of the Lord has appeared to us. For darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will be our everlasting light. His glory will shine upon us forever. <laughs> dear friends, let us join our hearts and minds together as we are a people united in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, you create and love us. You invite us to live together in community. We acknowledge that this community looks different than we imagine and that within this community we are sometimes slow to do good we are sometimes blinded to what is in front of us. We are sometimes complicit in deferring dreams and hopes. We condemn together those things which draw us away from your path. We cling to all that you have given us and ask that you forgive us for you are gracious and teach us to forgive others. On this day, we remember all of the giants of faith who have gone before us and the way they have worked together to fill each of us with a vision for life, your vision brought into reality. Help us to walk on that journey of faith. Fill us with your vision of hope and love. Guide us to live by your vision of compassion and justice and empower us to work to build the beloved community where all are welcomed, valued, where all is shared, and all your children know wholeness and well-being in, in accordance with the commands of Christ our Lord. Shake us from all the places of our sleep and wake us to the work you have before us. Move us to action with compassion and grace and give us your courage. We pray that you may do this on earth in us through Jesus Christ. Amen. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust
scripture this morning is from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 32, verses 1 to 3a and 6 to 15. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the tenth year of King Zedekiah of Judah, which was the eighteenth year of Nebuchadnezzar. At that time, the army of the king of Babylon was besieging Jerusalem, and the prophet Jeremiah was confined in the court of the guard that was in the palace of the king of Judah, where King Zedekiah of Judah had confined him. Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came to me. Hanamel, son of your uncle Shalom, is going to come to you and say, Buy my field that is in Anathoth, for the right of redemption by purchase is yours. Then my cousin Hanamel came to me in the court of the guard, in accordance with the word of the Lord, and said to me, Buy my field that is at Anathoth in the land of Benjamin, for the right of possession and redemption is yours. Buy it for yourself. Then I knew that this was the word of the Lord. And I bought the field at Anathoth from my cousin Hanamel, and weighed out the money to him, seven shekels of silver. I signed the deed, sealed it, got witnesses, and weighed the money on scales. Then I took the sealed deed of purchase, containing the terms and conditions, and the open copy. And I gave the deed of purchase to Baruch, son of Neriah, son of Messiah, in the presence of my cousin Hanamel, in the presence of the witnesses who signed the deed of purchase, and in the presence of all the Judeans who were sitting in the court of the guard. In their presence I charged Baruch, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Take these deeds, both this deed, sealed deed of purchase and this open deed, and put them in an earthenwood jar, in order that they may last for a long time. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Houses and fields and vineyards shall again be bought in this land. The New Testament reading for this morning is from the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. I want to thank Pastor Beth for inviting me to preach. She doesn't give up the pulpit very often, for which we are grateful. Uh, if she's not preaching, she's probably either on vacation or sick. So we all continue to pray that she will get to feeling better and soon be her old self again. If there was ever a time when we need a word of hope, this is it. The COVID-19 virus, insurrection in our nation's capital, racial injustice, income inequality, the need for better health care. But this morning, let's think about what was going on uh, when the Old Testament reading was written, when Jeremiah uh, was speaking. Because he also lived in a time of catastrophe. The date is 587 B.C. Uh, after 400 years, the uh, country of Judah is coming to an end. Nebuchadnezzar and the armies of Babylon are at the gate. They are about to uh, sack the city and the temple. And 
Jeremiah has been thrown in a royal prison by Zedekiah, the king of Judah. Having been confined to our homes, we have a kindred spirit in Jeremiah. Uh, he was confined to his home and for a different reason than we have been. He's under house arrest because he has said some things that Zedekiah does not like. So there's Jeremiah when all of this is going on and suddenly a new word comes to, to him. The word comes to, from the Lord to Jeremiah to go by the family farm. That's B-U-Y not be wide. Go by the family farm. By the way, I'm indebted to Walter Brueggemann, an Old Testament professor and scholar, for some of the ideas in this sermon. We are told that Jeremiah obeyed the command. He paid 17 shekels of silver, which was a lot of money in that day and age. So here's this purchase of land just when this his world is falling apart. Just when the world seemed totally out of control, he bought the property. Can you imagine what his neighbors must have thought? Uh, Jeremiah, Jerusalem is about to fall to the armies of Babylon. And the inhabitants are about to be rounded up and taken to Babylon as prisoners. Can't you just hear uh, Jeremiah's neighbors? Hey, old man, don't waste your money on this land. You're probably not going to get back here anyway. You should squirrel away the 17 shekels of silver because you're going to need them where you're going. Now, I know you don't care that much about this ancient land transaction, except for one thing. As he was wrapping up the deal, Jeremiah got another word from God. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, houses and fields and vineyards shall again be bought in this land. Can you imagine if you really believe that that word came from God and Jeremiah did? That's a word of hope if I ever heard it. The first word was by the property. The second word that this property, with all of the land, the, the habitations, uh, the fields, uh, this will have a new and a wonderful future because God will see to it. The whole land will prosper with new habitation and new agriculture and fields and vineyards and well-being and safety and shalom. The promise is against all that you would expect, but the promise came from God who has made a pledge for a new and wonderful future. Now, one thing I get out of this is that uh, Jeremiah dealt with the things that were right in front of him. Let me be honest with you. I would really rather not deal with the things right in front of me. I would rather not pay attention to the recommendations of the uh, Center for Disease Control. It's no fun to be physically distanced from each other. And it's a, it's a pain in the you-know-what to have to wear masks all the time. But you know what I mean? How tempting it is to stick our head in the sand. I would rather not have to deal with that member of my family who doesn't want to have anything to do with me. I would rather not think about the conflict over sexuality in the United Methodist Church, a church that I grew up in and that I love. I would rather not think about homelessness and hunger and immigration and inability of our government to uh, come together and compromise. 
But this land transaction in the book of Jeremiah has a word to say to us today. Jeremiah didn't want to buy the property. He knew what was coming. But he was a man of faith. And he believed those instructions came from God. Surely at one of the lowest points in his life, Jeremiah realized that God was going to bring something new and wonderful. Now for the Christian, there's an even greater reason for our hope, is there not? For we know the greatest gift of God in Jesus Christ. To much of the world, we are fools to believe in Christ, just as foolish as Jeremiah was to buy the family farm. Paul writes to the Christians at Corinth, for the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Well, what can I say? I can't buy the family farm. The ranch that I grew up on uh, along the San Pedro River, about 70 miles north of here, is now owned by the Nature Conservancy, and they don't want to sell it. But I have the church, and you have the church, the body of Christ. What gives me hope? When I picture members of the body of Christ sequestered in your homes, praying for one another, giving thanks for our blessings, lifting up our voices in the praise of God, we are each a part of the body of Christ. Many have been able to communicate in this time of isolation and be a source of strength and joy for one another. To know that we're on the same journey, separate but together. I look forward to the time when we can be together again in the, this sanctuary. I look forward to the time when we can kneel uh, next to each other at the Lord's table. In the eyes of the world, says Paul, this business of the cross is foolishness. But to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. It's really a, a pretty tough world in which we live in many ways, which is why we need each other. And there are some pretty amazing things happening during this time in which we are kept apart. People have found new ways to reach out to one another. It isn't very long ago that I had never heard the word Zoom. I, I thought it was what we did as kids with the little car, Zoom, Zoom, Zoom. Well, our, our kids and our grandkids have taught us of, of the marvels of social, social media and how to stay in touch with one another, not only to speak with one another, but to be able to see each other. And there's also the old-fashioned ways, picking up the phone and calling somebody, or, oh my gosh, even writing a note and sending it by snail mail. There are plenty of others who could use a good word, too, who could use a helping hand, who do not know the Lord. Could Jesus be saying to us, it's the poor and sick that are the carriers of God's future. Just like the old family farm. Go out and find the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. I have come to call not the righteous, but the sick. Well, God doesn't call us to take the easy way. Jeremiah bought the family farm even though he looked like a fool. He foreshadowed the one who looked like a fool up on the cross. But by that very act, he saved the world. He saves the world still when we are true to our calling. We as the body of Christ now in the earth so if we will keep our eyes open and not bury our heads in the sand, 
uh, and be aware of the needs that are around us. Jesus walked among us to show us and teach us how to love one another. And this is what we are called to do, to be aware of the needs around us, to reach out in love, to hold each other in prayer, to be courageous and work for justice and peace among the nations. Houses and fields and vineyards shall again be bought in this land. Amen. How manifold are your works, amazing God. When there is darkness in our lives, we can look to you for light and for hope and for renewal of life. Your spirit comes and we are lifted up and linked to one another. We bring our offerings as an expression of thanksgiving for all your gifts. May your glory be proclaimed in all we give and all we do, when we are together and when we are apart, so that we will do your will wherever we are. Amen. which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
my friends receive this benediction. No matter where God meets us, God is for us. No matter where God leads us, God is with us. No matter what God asks of us, God will see us through. So let us be courageous in everything we do. Amen. Thank you.